Hey, everybody. I'm Josh. I'm here with Pat North. Pat is the chief remote sensing uh, engineer at AGI. Yes. And we're going to talk about something that we've already talked about a little bit, and that is large constellations and how they could be affecting different types of sensors. So we're really excited. There's so many new satellites, so many new constellations going up, and uh, there's hundreds of Starlink going up this year. And there's been some concern in the general industry that this is going to cause problems with some sensors, and Pat's going to go into some detail about the effects that we can expect that these large constellations have. Today we're going to specifically talk about Starlink because we've done that in the past. So that's what you see behind us here. We did a video before how you can go over to Celestrack and you can pull down the data to go out and see these awesome star tra uh, Starlink trains and point your telescopes to get, take awesome pictures of them. And there's a video how you can do use the Celestrack Pass visualizer to figure out which direction to look. And today we're going to talk about how much you're going to expect to see when you do that. So here's a, another quick picture from T.S. Kelso that he went out and took, I think it was uh, just recently, of the train and some of the satellites that he got pictures of. The general concern is that these satellites are going to be flying over telescopes, uh, long exposure sensors that are people are trying to take pictures of stars and things behind them, and these are going to come in and, and ruin the exposure that they had. So, Pat, is this the end of astronomy as we know it? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Things are going to change forever. But I don't think it's the end of astronomy forever. That's, <laughs> that's the idea. So will we be able to see these occasionally? Yes, absolutely. Will you ever be able to go out camping with your family and see the Milky Way and you know the stars at night? Yes, absolutely. And I think the key here to think about is, you know, when will you be able to see these? And actually, we create a visualization SDK where you can see these passing overhead. And what we displayed, actually, Josh, if you want to explain what that red cone is really Yeah, quick. so what we're looking at here behind us, and we're looking on a screen up here in front of us, is the red cone is the shadow of the Earth. And we just loaded in the latest position data for the Starlink satellites from Celestrack. And you can see here's a train coming over us tonight that we would be able to see. And if we go forward on that, these satellites would be visible, right, Pat? Because they're not... Yeah, so the two keys are, are we in darkness? And it looks like it's just after sunset, so it's twilight. And these blue satellites, these cyan satellites, they're they're in light, you know, so they're going to be illuminated. And those are the opportunities where, yes, you will be able to see those at twilight. However, if you look at that geometry, these are in low Earth orbit. So they're, they're not super high up. And you can see that if we follow that Terminator line just a little bit, they're going to be going into shadow relatively quickly. So the occasions where we have just that right geometry, so that these are, you know, definitely in sunlight and we are in darkness, That's the th those are the opportunities where we will be able to see these. However, that's predictable. And by the time, you know, we're a few hours past twilight, all of a sudden, you know, there's no way, even if these are passing directly overhead, they wouldn't be visible because they're not going to be illuminated because they are in such a low Earth orbit. So the idea is, you know, occasionally you will get that geometry so that you can see them, and it'll be a neat phenomenology. But for looking at the stars at night, for doing astrophotography, you should be able to do a little bit of planning to avoid those, you know, dusk and dawn types of situations where you would expect these to be illuminated and your your site is in darkness where you would be trying to take those types of pictures or you know stare up at the sky. And depending on how many of these types of systems eventually there are, this might start to be a you know dusk dawn type of phenomenology where you see many you know different sparkling satellites traveling over the sky at night. But the idea is for critical astrophotography, when we're you know, trying to unravel the mysteries of the universe, there are going to be plenty of opportunities to do that still. And for you know, a lot of the observatories, it might just be a matter of reshuffling their schedule. So if we're going to you know, stare at this area for a really long time, we can, we can learn a lot about what these will look like to say, you know what, maybe we can task this slightly different. Or maybe I can take shorter exposure times to avoid you know, those really long duration times. Or you know, I know this is going to be a contested area during these, you know, windows. I'm just going to try and reshuffle that to a better time during the night to image those. Very cool. So let's now go into a little bit more detail about what yep. you could expect these uh, reflections to look like. Exactly. How bright are these things are going to be? Geometrically, we know where they're going to be. Now, well, you know, are they visible? And that's the question. So again, continuing with our Starlink example, and just to be perfectly clear, we are super excited for Starlink satellites to be up there. So um, I'll be first in line for global high-speed satellite internet. So, And glo global high-speed pizza delivery as well. Um, That's what I've been waiting for. Yeah. So in, in this example, uh, we're, we're going to take a look at 
the model shape and the phenomenology that that dictates uh, for the visibility. So, Pat, why don't you tell us what we're looking at here? That's right. So this is an example 3D model that was built, and this is supposed to be like one of the Starlink types of satellites. So what we have here, I've been calling this an L-frame. It's very much, you know, you've got a big solar panel, and then you've got a body that actually is supposed to do something. But from my perspective, I'm, I'm more interested in the shape and the size in general. And then we're going to get into some of the other properties that are important. But this is the general type of layout. What we have here, we've got you know about a nine meter tall solar panel. And that's pretty darn big. And, yeah, it's a big satellite. Yeah, and it's about three meters, you know, a little over three meters wide. And then this body itself is about you know one and a half meters or so. So we've got a pretty big object and we have a lot of them. But this is the general shape and size of this. And when we're talking about brightness, the primary drivers for that are how far away are these objects from us? It doesn't matter how many photons are landing on this and being reflected. As we move away from something, the brightness falls off with a distance squared. And then the next important factor is what are the angles involved? Because we could we could be right next to this object, but if the sun is shining in a way that doesn't reflect off of any of the surfaces, then we don't have anything to worry about. But that phase angle becomes important to know how much energy is striking this and then reflecting in our direction. So what I drew here, we have two different phase functions. So the phase angle is just like the phases of the moon. You know, we could have a full moon, which means you know we've got 100% of the light striking this object and bouncing right back at us. So there we'd expect you know all the energy from a simple sphere or a plate to be reflecting back towards us. But as that phase angle changes, so you know the phases of the moon, so once we've got a half moon or we've got you know a three quarters of a moon, you know, a quarter of a moon, that amount of energy falls off if you're a, a sphere or a plate. Well, this L frame is very much like two different plates. And if we combine those two phase functions together, we have a phase function for the body and the solar panels. And we can look at this as a function of two angles, a bi-directional reflectance function. And we can say, well, from you know the way these satellites are oriented, what is the angle to the sun and to our sensor or to us if we're the observer? And we can see that you know, we fall off. Basically, you know, the phase function changes with the angle to both the sun and, you know, the direction of light that we're shining into. So you're showing the red is... The red is brighter, and as you fall away from that, it's going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And we can see that it's almost a reciprocal relationship here because the angles, the, the as you would get less reflection from the body, you'll get more from the solar panels. But that's the general phase function. The material properties become important after this. So, you know, this is in general how those phase functions work. But then how reflective are these parts that we're looking at? So you could have all the right geometry, but then if you are a super dark solar panel, maybe you're, you know, 5% reflective or 0.1% reflective. So those are going to come into effect. So we have an amount of area and the percent of reflectance for those different shapes. And what we plugged in here were some general types of parameters to say, you know, given this type of geometry and this type of range, what would the visual magnitude be for this particular scenario? And we can see that, you know, we've seen brightnesses of about, you know, four visual magnitude, which is pretty darn bright. That's yeah. as bright as a lot of common stars that we all know about in common constellations. Visible to the naked eye, for sure. Can you exactly. go into the visual magnitude background? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So what I wanted to do is show an example of what that visual magnitude looks like. So one of the ways I like to get folks calibrated with visual magnitude is I like to show an example that we're all pretty familiar with. So this is the constellation Orion. And what you can see here is these are the brightnesses for a lot of those common stars. And anyone can go into their backyard and say, well, you know, can I find Orion's belt? And from that, okay, those shoulders are pretty good. You know, they're, they're very bright stars. But in between that is the head. And what you can do is you can say, well, if that's about a three and a half visual magnitude brightness, if these could be about that bright, can I see that? And what I've done to calibrate myself is say, all right, you know, which stars, the bright stars, can I see? And as I go to the dimmer and the dimmer and the dimmer stars, again, if you're in an urban area, if you have a lot of light pollution, you might not even be able to see MISA here at the top. And that's a three and a half. So these would be dimmer than that most opportunities that you would have to see them. So that's that's at least one easy way to say, you know, can you see these stars? All right, so that's about, you know, an easy way to get calibrated to say, you know, if you can see these stars, this is where you would start to be able to visualize these satellites if they were flying overhead. The visual magnitude scale is a log scale. So, you know, an order of magnitude dimmer, you know, that is, you know, a, a four and a half. That's, you know, 
well, it's actually two and a half times brightness scale. So, you know, it's less than half as bright physically, but our eyes see things on a log scale also. So the idea is, you know, going from a, a half to one and a half to two and a half to three and a half, essentially, if you keep continuing, okay, I can see that. Okay, this is this much dimmer. This is that much dimmer. Now I would expect to start to see things when I can see things in that brightness scale. And, you know, chances are if these are nice and bright, you know, then we would start to see them, you know, with the naked eye. We can see to about a visual magnitude of six or seven without using any other apparatus given the skies are dark enough. So, you know, a prerequisite just to see these at all is are your skies dark enough? Are you looking in the right place at the right time? So that's pretty good news for astronomers, but let's talk a little bit about where this might impact space situational awareness sensors. Yep. So SSA sensors... Those are systems typically on the ground, but they could be in space also, and they're looking at other objects in space, so space debris or active satellites, things like that. And typically, you'll have something that looks like this, you know, a lot of blobs, blobology, but um, we might be looking at a, a satellite, and it's, it's a certain brightness, and what we're going to have here, I, I actually drew a little green circle around it, but I can show you what this target and stars would look like. So we have this object amongst a, a field of stars, and... Again, if I make this even brighter, so I'll, I'll double it to double so its brightness. Just, just to explain what we're looking at is you've written code to simulate what you would get if you were taking a picture under these certain circumstances. Yep. That's what we're looking at yep. here. Or if you're a telescope zoom, zoomed in on a satellite that was moving. And here we're sidereally tracking. So we're focused on the stars and we have space objects, satellites moving through the field of view. And what might these this train of, of satellites look like? That's the idea. So... For example, I'll show, so now we've got, and I'm just calling these, you know, clutter objects for now. So here we have that train of objects moving through the scene. That that looked a lot like TS's picture earlier. And if we said, well, instead of 10 of these, let's make this, you know, 60 or 100 or 1,000. And you can see that if this train were to continue on, the only times we would be worried for SSA purposes are if this is actually physically, you know, running over our objects of interest. And that's only going to happen in a few different scenarios. There's how long are we imaging for? If our integration times are really, really long, just like with astronomy, you know, with the astrophotography, if you're integrating for a longer period of time, chances are that somebody could, you know, be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, you know, with longer integration times is important, also with larger fields of view. So if our resolution is very low, again, each individual pixel is covering a larger area, or we're looking at a whole lot of the sky at once, again, somebody could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. If we know where these objects are flying, then we can plan for that accordingly. But if we're just you know, trying to figure out what the phenomenology is, period. So what are these going to look like with an integration time of one second versus, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, if I integrate for 10 seconds, well, I would expect to have a much longer amount of smear because these guys are moving through my scene and the stars, they're in the same spot. So they're getting brighter and brighter with each second. But, you know, my objects are smearing out over a longer and longer area of time. So their relative, their peak brightness is going to get dimmer against the stars. But let's say, you know, I, I'm imaging against a dimmer star field. So I'll, I'll lower that. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, these are now the brightest objects in the scene if the stars are dimmer. So, you know, and I haven't changed the brightness of the satellites, but the, the background itself. And what we can see is, well, you know, we can start to say, wow, okay, so if if, if this is my target of interest and I'm really interested and this just happens to be what these, you know, satellites moving through my scene look like, how can I play with integration time? Maybe instead of, you know, integrating for 10 seconds, I try and integrate for two seconds and I can, you know, just start to see, okay, you know, now I can see my target. All of a sudden, hey, this is these are the right settings I should be using when I'm trying to collect that type of data. And you were going to talk a little bit about star sensors? How oh, they yeah. Pop, yeah, so possibly be one of the funny effective. things... Is so again, we're not used to seeing these mega constellations, so we're still getting used to it. But you know, we're we're humans; we're pretty good at adapting. However, what about some of the legacy systems that we have? So, for example, if we're if we're looking for fireballs in the sky and these things start to show up, well, those systems that were designed to see those, you know, those objects entering into our atmosphere and they're looking for any bright flashes in the sky, they're going to get thrown off. They're going to have false positives from things like that. Similarly, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the first star sensors on LEO satellites, how they react when they see a whole bunch of satellites, which they never expected to see before. We've got a lot of legacy systems that might get, you know, 
completely tricked the first time they see these, and they are going to need to be updated, for example, to say, oh, you know, I, w- I was never written to handle something like this because this type of situation has never existed before. Now that we've got this new type of phenomenology to deal with, we're going to have to figure out how every system that's been using space as an asset is going to react to it. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, Pat. I really yeah. appreciate you coming on and explaining some of this stuff to us. Image I mean, science of- nerds like myself, <laughs> you know, we only get to actually help every so often, but this is one of the yes. cases where I get to actually nerd out on how bright things look like in outer space. M- most important question of the day, what's your favorite space movie? Oh, man. So I am a fan of Alien, and I am uh, looking forward to showing that to my kids when they get a little bit older. Yeah. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to be p- probably talking about these topics many more times. And we have a webinar, I think, planned to go into some more analysis, some uh, radio frequency interference analysis coming up. So just head on over to AGI.com or stay tuned here on YouTube, and you'll, um, you'll see it as it comes out. So thanks, Pat. All right, thank you. All right. See you, everybody. All right.